Hello everyone, this is Jimmy, and welcome to episode 30 of FDB Interactions. Between episodes, I've been continuing to run ores through our ore processor. I, these are the six types, I guess, that I've gone through, and they've all produced a ton of dust. I think I did like four stacks of bauxite ore, and now we have uh, 75,000 bauxite dust. Yeah, it really, one stack of ore explodes into a million dust. But... Some of this dust we have to process further to make useful. Tungsten, specifically, we first have to electrolyze into tungsten, which is a slow process. Even at EV, it's a 45 second process. And then we have to blast furnace it into hot tungsten, which at EV is probably also somewhere around 150 seconds. And then, you know, after that we freeze it. And if we want, we can process it further into tungsten steel or tungsten carbide, both of which I believe are useful. So, in light of that, let's set up a system that will automatically process, process tungsten. Right now, I'm processing it by hand by throwing it into this electrolyzer. Uh, in fact, I, I guess it's done processing right now because it's all processed. But, it's better to automate, right? So, I'll set up an electrolyzer. Um, normally, there's also shelite, I believe it's what it's called, which is also tungsten. But, when we, like, when you process shelite down into shelite dust, the, uh... Shelite dust is also one seventh tungsten. However, I found that when we convert shelite into a dense ore via this process, it becomes dense tungsten ore. So, in fact, let's watch the next one pop in. So, uh, we only have to process tungsten, which I guess is convenient. Anyways, let's get another EV electrolyzer to process that with. If you're going to use an electrolyzer to handle multiple different inputs, it's important that you don't just jam an unlimited amount of a single input in because then you can end up with a situation like I have over here where you have you know a partial recipe left over. However, because I'm going to use this electrolyzer to only pr process tongue state and it's going to process it 100% of the time, it you're allowed to just jam tongue state in here because if you have tongue state left over at the end, well, who cares? That's you know the only thing this machine is going to process. And in fact... It takes so long to process tungstate. Let's actually get a second electrolyzer. We'll uh, we'll have two electrolyzers processing tungstate at all times. The reason I'm going with two is that two electrolyzers pr uh, processing tungstate is just about the same speed as one EV blast furnace cooking it. So let's add another EV blast furnace here to process the tungsten dust that comes out. Um, Right now, I oh, I should make sure to throw away the oxygen that comes out here, right? I don't really need that. The lithium that gets processed, I'm just storing for now, although I don't really have a good use for it. I have plenty of lithium from other sources, but I guess I'll just, I don't know, I'll store it and maybe eventually it'll be used for something other than just wasting storage space. There's three new blast furnaces in total. One of these is doing tungsten ingots. This has its limit set arbitrarily high. Essentially, I basically never want to stop making tungsten, but I want to have the option to turn this on at a later time. I don't know if there's a, some reason to. One is making tungsten steel, and this one is making tungsten carbide. Tungsten carbide is used for draconic cores, I believe, which is why it's somewhat useful. Um, I can find the wire mill. Wait, did that use for draconic cores? Oh no, here it is. Here's the recipe. So yeah, I previously had skipped making draconic cores in favor of finding them in dungeons. But at this point, the only thing I need to make for draconic cores is tungsten carbide. So since my tungsten is automated, it's easier to make them than to find them. I also changed up the way I did my wiring up here. Instead of giving each import bus its own export, or each uh, input bus, yeah. That's a little confusing to say. Instead of giving each input bus its own export bus from Applied Logistics, I'm exporting all the different resources through a single ME interface and then sending them to the appropriate things with filters. Um, two reasons. One of the biggest reason that I'm doing it this way is that it saves on a lot of channels and a lot of devices by extension. This one interface can do the work of up to eight export buses. You can up to 
well, technically up to nine export buses. You can export nine different types of items. However, if you do all nine types, you can't insert items into here anymore. So I have to do eight different type, up to eight different types of items and leave one slot for inserting items into. That way we can also get rid of all the export buses. In this way, it is probably less laggy than using a lot of buses, not on account of it doing any less work, right? It does the same amount of work, but we have one device instead of here we would have we would we would have had under my previous design uh like this would have i would have split this up into two import buses or two export buses on the two input buses so yeah we cut down on a lot of devices which i i can't i can't imagine that hurts at least um i'll probably retrofit our existing blast furnaces over to this type of design too Anyways, so this is all the tungsten byproducts taken care of. I should actually, yeah, you know what? What I'll do is I'll retrofit these blast furnaces to match that design. In the meantime, because I was previously cooking tungsten and tungsten steel in these, I can switch some of these over to making like steel or not steel, um, stainless steel because I don't want to run out of stainless steel anymore. And these are, I stopped using these because these are just HV blast furnaces and they're a little bit slower naturally than EV blast furnaces. Another convenient side effect of putting multiple products into the same input bus, it frees up an input slot on the top that if these recipes require fluids, I can put the fluid on top now instead of having to do the weird thing where, you know, I have to jump underneath the base to configure the fluid export bus to handle the whatever fluids go into these blast furnaces. And now our blast furnace here are all switched over. The differences between what we're doing here and what we're doing over with those blast furnaces are, well, there's a few of them. First of all, I'm crafting stainless steel from its components on site. This is because I don't want to have to put a crafting card in here. So instead of exporting stainless steel, I just export all the components of stainless steel and turn it into the dust. Uh, I could have used a mixer instead of a crafter, but I found it's easier to just wirelessly transport RF than it is to... I mean, I guess I could have put like a wire right here. Anyways, the difference is negligible. Um, most, or at least some of these blast furnaces also use fluids. So as I mentioned, I can I get to put the fluid input hatch up top. Hydrogen. In fact, why are these... Am I just straight up out of hydrogen? I might be consuming too much hydrogen now. Especially running two of these. Yeah, I'm consuming too much hydrogen. All right, well, that's a good thing to know. Um, I'll ramp up my hydrogen production in just one second. Besides that, this last one here is still using helium, so I just have a tank of helium feeding it. But now if I have to replace the helium, I don't have to dive under the base for it anymore. So uh, yeah, much better design for, for blast furnaces, I think. I needed a second interface here because I just ran out of slots on the first one. No biggie. When you place these interfaces, do yourself a favor and hit the hide button just so that they don't show up on your interface terminal because you I can't imagine a world in which you want to put recipes into these interfaces. Well, it's finally happened. I went to put in a recipe for a MV chemical reactor and uh, I'm out of room in my mass assembly chamber. So let's... I guess let's make more pattern holders. Is that what there's called? I almost went to register a pattern for the pattern holder, but uh, well, we can't put the pattern anywhere. All right, so let's put maybe another 10 in there. While I'm at it, I may as well fill up the entire interior with pattern holders and what's the other one? Um, the thing that makes it craft faster, co-processor. And with these last two co-processors, this mass assembly chamber is full. I can make it bigger. I believe the max size, these go to is 5x5x5 five by five by five interior. So that's 125 interior spaces. But, um, I mean, yeah, if I want to add more pattern holders now, I have to, you know, expand it in at least one dimension. But for now, this means that we have 14 pages of recipes. And our previous recipes are just... Yeah, and some of the later pages. Having more co-processes means we now do 40 work a tick. I don't know how much work a tick we did before, but all I know is that it makes it faster. To meet my freshly increased hydrogen demand, I've got eight 
chemical reactors here and two chickens laying eggs for them. Apparently two chickens don't lay enough eggs for eight HV chemical reactors. Originally I was going to do these with MV just to be a bit more energy efficient, but I figured energy is plentiful and I, uh, I should have more than I think I need because I'm going to end up scaling up my hydrogen consumption throughout, you know, as we continue. But yeah, it looks like we're going to need a few more chickens. Let me get, a, I don't know, two more roots of chickens. It took six chickens to produce enough gassy eggs for all eight H3 chemical reactors. And that's producing plenty of hydrogen now. Our buffer drum here is basically full. And they're gonna these machines will slowly start filling their internal buffers. This uh this way of making hydrogen far beats what I had to do in Omni Factory. If anyone remembers, I had a array of I don't know maybe two hundred LV electrolyzers processing water to make hydrogen. Yeah, that was that was rough. This is much better. And now all of our hydrogen consuming machines are no longer waiting for hydrogen to run. Haha. -ha. Enough housekeeping. Let's get on to today's project. I want to go get Gaia Spirits. Gaia Spirits are used in this pack to make the artifact that lets you go to Aurelia. And I figure it's been a while since we visited a new planet. Let's get on it. Now, Gaia Spirits are only part of the solution. Osberidium, that's not too bad. I think that's just Osbium and Iridium. Who'd have thought, eh, with helium? Um, temperature isn't even particularly high. In fact, it's even very quick. Wow. I like it. The other part, though, is also slightly more difficult, and that's red matter. But uh, I'll look at that later. In fact, that's even an IV recipe. Although we can do IV blast furnace recipes off EV power pretty easily. Anyways, let's start with the Gaia Spirit. So this requires killing the Batania boss, which I imagine with our uh, absorption hearts will be a trivial matter. But I still have to make the arena to fight it. The arena takes four Gaia pylons, which I think we should just be able to make. Elementium and Pixie Dust and one beacon. For now, I'm just gonna yoink our beacon because it's not exactly doing anything. What is our benefit from it even? Is it, just, oh no, here it is. It's giving us speed. Oh, whatever. Apparently it takes a long time to break, but uh, I'll just borrow this. Uh, I guess I do feel the difference without it. We'll put it back when we're done. You can use the Lexica Batania to help you build the required blocks for the arena. But I already have it built here, so get out of here. Get out of here. There we go. And then all you have to do is right click a piece of uh, Terra Steel on, or shift right click, get on the beacon, and the fight begins. The fight does turn off any creative flight you have, so unless you have pseudo creative flight, like from a jetpack, you won't be able to fly. But uh, apparently, multi shot's really good against him because it bypasses his damage gate. Normally he only takes up to a certain amount of damage per shot, but multi-shot means, well, or he takes a certain amount of damage per hit, but multi-shot means you hit him multiple times. He also teleports after every hit, but I guess the multi-shots hit him close enough together that he doesn't get a chance to teleport. So yeah, multi-shot bow is very good against Kai Guardian. Anyways, once he gets low enough, he does an intermission phase, where you kill some uh, trash for a little while. Eventually he gets bored of hanging out up there all by himself and he jumps back down to meet you. Give me time now, buddy. Welcome back. Alright, first fight done. The first Guardian of Gaia gives you a few... Here's something angry. Gives you a few Gaia Spirits. Let's, let me delete some of this trash and we should... Where are my Gaia Spirits? Um, that's awkward. They're not just hiding somewhere, are they? Let me take a look around. I legitimately have no clue what happened there. I even played back the video, and I did not see any Gaia Spirits drop off him when he died. So maybe he doesn't like being last hit by a ranged weapon? I typically use melee weapons against him, so I guess we'll try it again, except this time I'll get the last hit with a melee weapon. I briefly considered the possibility that you had to kill Gaia Guardian 2 to get Gaia Spirits in this pack. However, the 
Oh, that's gonna kill him, isn't it? Oh no, he intermission. All right. Um, the guy guardian two doesn't, or the item to summon him, the guy spirit ingot requires guy spirits. So that's clearly not it. Also, sometimes I, you know, those bats aren't immune. I had some bats be range immune. I have no clue why. Anyways, let's uh, let's just go through go through the steps here again. This fight does have very good music. All right, there we go. I guess it doesn't like it if you range hit him. I don't know. That's the only thing I did differently, right? Is I last hit him with the range or with the melee attack. All right, why am I putting these in storage? But yeah, I don't know. Uh, who's shooting me? Oh, hi there. All right. Well, anyways, first guy guardian's done. Technically, that's all we have to do for now because these guy spirit ingots will or the eight guy spirits are enough to get us the the artifact. However, I do like the loot that the second guardian guy guardian guardian of guy i don't know what you call him can uh, can drop so let's turn these guy spirits and our remaining terra steel into guy spirit ingots and go fight the second guardian this actually takes a very hot blast furnace does um what do we have does tungsten steel even get hot enough for this let's see tungsten steel coil 4500 yes it does haha I don't normally set up blast furnaces for on-demand work. However, Terra Steel and Guy Spirit ingots both are made in a blast furnace with unstable mana, and they are made pretty darn quickly. So I figured I'll just make these on demand. And let's request two Guy Spirit ingots. Um, oh, I used the wrong Terra Steel in the recipe. Whoopsies. Let's try that again. Two Guy Spirit ingots. And these should take about 10 seconds each. Lo and behold, one is done and it took it exactly 9 seconds. That's why the A system assumes you know each task takes the same amount of time. So if the first one took 9 seconds, well the second one's also going to take 9 seconds. Alright, let's go fight the Gaia boss again. The second fight is actually normally pretty difficult. He does a lot of damage in this mode. But uh, we don't really care for taking damage. I mean... I don't think we can be killed by dealing damage to us. I am told that if you hit him hard enough, you can skip the intermission phase, but I've never done it. Would be nice. Well, the second fight does have a different soundtrack, so there's still something to appreciate. What happened there? I got teleported. Oh look, a uh, spider came to join us. I guess at some point I should finish setting up that loose- oh, I shouldn't shoot him with that. Mm, did he drop Gaia ingots? Ooh, a dragon bone bow. That sounds cool. Let's see if he dropped in or guy spirits that time. Oh, another dragon bone bow. Oh, he did. All right, cool. Then I I really have no clue why why it didn't work the first time. Oh, we got a pinkinator. Are these used for anything in this pack? Nah, they can uh you turn with those pink with them. Anyways, that dice. That's what I'm after. So let me clean up my inventory here a bit. And I think there's two ways we can use dice in this pack. We can straight up, well, we can right click to open it, which turns it into a random piece of loot, or we can choose which piece of loot we want with the alchemical matter infuser. That's pretty cool. Uh, I guess you can only choose between these four. But I think you can change, yeah, you can change the rings between different modes. All right, anyways, um, I want actually let me think about what i want to do with this then none of the relics are actually all that useful anymore 
normally I like to go for the ring of I forget I forget if it's Odin or Thor, but one of them gives you ten extra hearts, which is pretty neat. The other kind of cool toy is a Key of King's Law, which is again, it's more of a toy than anything. It has one practical use, but I don't even need it for that in this pack. So let's see what we get. Hey, we got the key. Alright. Let me show you what this does. Using it requires mana in your inventory. That can come in the form of a mana tablet or a mana ring, or maybe there's a few other options. But once you have it, you just hold right click and uh, these swords appear behind you and then you aim it and you let go. And it shoots them. And they actually do a fair bit of damage where they hit and have a fairly large AOE. So uh, yeah, it's a halfway decent weapon, but it's like, hey, what, what am I going to kill with that? Squids? Aha, I killed that squid real good. It's one practical use is that it bypasses the Chaos Dragon's immunity, but we can just kill the Chaos Dragon's crystals to also bypass his immunity. So, meh. Anyways, um, I mean, I made this well here. Is there any use for this other than... It can turn into Shulkly Knots or Kekamirises, neither of which I'm remotely interested in. So, I guess let's just fight the boss again. Are we going to be able to kill him? I don't know, it's a tough fight. We did it. Wow. Who'd have thought? What's in the dice this time? Ring of Thor. Um, which one is that? I guess that's not going to tell me. The Ring of Thor makes your Terra shatter or better. I should make one of those, actually. For when I want to go dig up of ore vein, I can uh, dig up the entire vein at a time. I do have a perfectly free bobble slot, so I may as well wear it. I'll even put runic shielding on it. Well, my Terra Steel Crafts, I think we're probably done fighting the this boss for this pack. This isn't one of those packs where you have to fight him 20,000 times, which I think is good. He's not exactly a very entertaining fight. Anyways, I need to put my Spectre thingy back on top of this so I get my buff anywhere in this dimension. And an Iron get to set it back to speed 2. That's what I had it on, right? Aha! We go fast. Faster, at the very least. Alright, the Terra Shatter. Starts off D rank. It's a pretty unremarkable pickaxe at D rank. You go, th I think it mines like 3x3 three three if you have if you have the ring at D rank. But you throw it into a mana pool and uh, it sucks up mana and gets better. So we'll leave it there for a while. In fact, it levels up pretty quickly. Like it's already C rank. But it goes all the way up to... All the way up to double S rank. At which point... Um, doesn't say how much it mines, but I think it's like an 11 by 11, or maybe 13 by 13. By 13, it's a it's a cube, not not just like a plane. Yeah, it mines a lot of blocks at a time. But we have to let it sit in that mana pool for, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to guess about a day to reach double S rank. It uh, never despawns either. Next up on our journey to Aurelia is Osmeridium. So this is... As I mentioned before, not a very difficult recipe. Osmium and Iridium, which are both made in blast furnaces, put together with a little bit of helium. Um, the only things here that we aren't that we don't have well, we have the dusts for each of these, and we have helium being produced from our Inferno Deconglomerator. Is that what it's called? However, this thing has since stopped running because we've run out of mana. So let's give it its own flower to produce mana. We'll generate mana with that Petropanulia. It'll that's not how you pronounce that. Petropetunia. And it will directly send mana into the spreader, which puts it into the port there that accepts it. My gut feeling is that that mana port holds about a mana pool's worth of mana. So that's that's a lot of mana. And to power this, I've been told that apparently you the Petropanulia Petropetunia can suck mana out of nearby tanks as well. So let's try that out. We'll transfer mana into that tank, or not mana, we'll transfer oil into that tank, diesel into that tank, and yeah, we're off to the races again. All right, so um, yeah, that's plenty of end stone for now. So here's our, uh, I guess, 
It's mostly a helium producer. None of this other stuff really interests me. It's like, yay, sand, woohoo, ender pearls. While crafting that, though, I realized our oil supply is quite low again. So I guess it's time we go move our pump. Um, I think that I should keep in the back of my mind then that this oil supply only lasted a few days, this oil well. So I think it's telling me that... Uh, whoops, well, that didn't take me anywhere. Uh, all right. Anyways, uh, I think it's telling me that it's about time that we did something better than just moving our pump every couple days. So, uh, yeah, it looks like it pumped most of this out. I'll keep that in mind. That'll be a project, you know, an upcoming project, I guess. All right, pumps were moved once again. Let's also move our trunk loading so that we load the trunk it's actually in. And, uh, yeah, all it has to do is pump. Just to make sure it's working, I dove down here and we can already see the oil being filled in with cobblestone. Haha. -ha. I have just enough room here to slip in one more blast furnace, so I'll put my iridium blast furnace right next to my osmium one. Unfortunately, that means our osmium iridium blast furnace needs to go somewhere else, um, or I need to move my, my multi-smelter. I ended up moving our multi-smelter out of the way so I can continue expanding our... What's this called? Blast furnace array. Uh, there's no benefit for the, you know, per there's no particular benefit to putting the multi smelter in any one location, but putting blast furnaces next to each other continues to let you share coils. Well, that just cuts down on tungsten steel usage. Following the usual trend, there's another blast furnace here that's just making osmium. So osmium and iridium are input via one bus. Helium comes from our helium thingy over there. Um, it might be a little slow. We, I think we need helium from another source pretty soon. But it is extremely cheap in the replicator. Only two millibuckets of each. I guess the cost is based on the atomic mass. But yeah, um, maybe I can set up a replicator to make helium soon if we need it in appreciable quantities. Anyways, this just makes osmiridium. We don't need tremendous amounts of osmiridium for now. In fact, I think two ingots gets us to Aurelia. No, four ingots, rather. But um, later it's used in Naquada Alloy, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, Naquada Alloy. So I have no doubt that we'll need more of it later. But I'll cross that bridge again when I get there. Now we've done all the easy bits of the Aurelia artifact. Now let's work on red matter. So void metal is going to require some uh, bomb craft progression. You know, let's start here. Ooh, I changed my mind. Let's start here. Um, vanadium, empowered void crystal, and primal mana. You say a void crystal, flawless coal, and mana pearl. All right. Let's consider, how much dark matter do I need? Do I need so much of it that I need it fully automated? Or is just batch crafting it enough? It's really just red matter that uses it in tremendous quantity. Uh, and do I need a lot of red matter? Oh, I do like my dark matter pedestal. This is the Project E one, right? This could tick accelerate things. It looks like both dark matter and red matter are relatively low volume usage. Um, oh, actually, I didn't look at the fluid red matter. Oh, I take that back. We're going to need a lot of red matter. I think this is the only way to make draconium ingots. At least the only way I've found so far to make draconium ingots. Um, and in fact, the quest seems to suggest as much. All right, we're going to need a lot of red matter. I was about to say maybe I can just run this process uh, not like on demand, but that's no longer a good idea. Well, darn. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So while the late game will no doubt involve a tremendous amount of red matter, right now I only need a single piece because the quest for red matter, oopsies, getting one piece of it rewards us with four more, and that's enough to get us to the Aurelia artifact. 
this only takes four total. So I'm not going to make a robust system. I'll just do something uh, quick, simple, and dirty. This takes a couple pieces of dark matter and what's the other one? A piece of void matter. All right, let's start with the dark matter. So dark matter is vanadium, which we already have. Primal mana. Sure, we can make this. Right? Yeah, I see no reason we couldn't make this. And uh, empowered void crystal. That takes flawless coal. So let's get some coal running through our ore processing system so that we can run it through a sifter to get flawless coal. I imagine one stack of coal ore, one process all the way up, should be more than sufficient to produce enough... Uh, enough flawless coal at least for the time being just kidding apparently coal doesn't have a densification system so we can't process coal this way whoopsies that's what i get for having a mining tool that is way too fast for my own good all right then i'll just use my hammer to crush this coal or uh i guess if i stand a little further whoop, whoop, i guess that's it i i put this modular storage here to It'll pick up the ores that I crush, and then I put two caches here as backstops because the hammer is incapable of breaking caches, whereas it basically, well, it does insta-mine cobble. So our coal is getting crushed, washed, and then sifted, and the outputs for that come into here. And I guess I, I'm starting to run out of room on this big item filter for things, but I... Uh, and I list all the different forms of coal that get produced so that I can extract them. And I'm about to run out of air. So let's head back to our main base and recharge our uh, spacesuit, or the air tanks on our armor at least. I've intentional, well, when I, I moved my gas charge pad over here, because I think I was a little cramped on space over there. And since I moved it, I don't like incidentally walk over it anymore. Before, when I had it placed right here, I would just like incidentally walk over it and recharge my armor. But now I have to actually go out of my way to recharge it. Oh, what a difficult life I live. And now I can craft the empowered void crystals. It's uh, not done in an empower like usual, but done in with the amalgamation agglomer agglomeration plate ah, got it right this time eight pieces of empowered void crystal should be enough for now and let's check on the status of our terra shatterer it is where is it a rank working on s i haven't made any runes yet but i did get some runes of fire presumably from the gaia guardian so i get to make a dominant spark augment with that, I can grab a spark as well, and a mana pool. Uh, for now, I'll just place this right here. And... Put the spark augment on the spark. This will automatically pull in mana from every other mana pool nearby. And that way, my Terra Shatter will... Uh, right now, when I was placing it in one mana pool, I was limited by the production of the flower that was linked to it, right? But now this mana pool gets mana from all eight mana pools, so I'm no longer limited. I do have to set the mana pool to give mana mode, though, not take mana mode. There we go. And now our Terra Shatter will level up just a little bit faster. Next step is to make a bit of primal mana. I think I need exactly eight buckets, is it? This uses a different fluid and needs four dark matter. So eight buckets of primal mana. Unfortunately, that means I need eight pieces of mana dust, which is 80 buckets of unstable mana. While I have that automated, my system for it is really slow. Uh, I mean, I have 128 buckets in a buffer, so I guess that's fine. Mix mana dust, vintium dust, that how it's pronounced? Vintium, yeah. And a little bit of deuterium in a chemical reactor. Apparently it takes a really long time. But that gives you a bucket of primal mana for each piece of mana dust. Ugh. Into a blast furnace it goes. And this should be making dark matter now. Yep, it's also really slow. Uh, I don't know how much I can accelerate this. I'm using a lot of EV power right now because I have a lot of blast furnaces running. Apparently the answer is less than three times because at three times it 
well, at three times, it periodically stutters. So I guess three acceleration ticks is the optimal amount. No sense stressing over how to make the uh, the dark matter go faster when making void matter is going to take an entire episode worth of stuff. Um, the void seed? This we can do. This isn't half bad at all. However, turning the void seed into actual void metal requires destructive will crystals, and this is going to require a fair bit of blood magic. It also takes a little bit of liquid nightmares, which means we have to get our uh, little farm here fixed up again. So let me make a few modifications to this farm to see if I can make it stop spawning endermen above the glass. When I first talked about the problem I had with this farm, someone mentioned in the comments that if I put a layer, or if I first raise the ceiling one so that there's still three block tall spawning area here, and put a layer of string right at the ceiling, the string should prevent the dust particles from reaching the ceiling, which means that that should prevent endermen from spawning right at the very top. I also made the roof too thick, um, just as a, I don't know, see if it helps. And let's turn this back on, and I'll let it run for a while and see if uh, we get any mobs spawning outside of the farm. I hope not. This definitely seems to help. Mobs, with the exception, well, no mobs are spawning outside of the cage, which is good. However, every now and then when Enderman spawns inside, it's, uh, I think when it takes damage for some reason, it's teleporting outside of the cage. I thought I had to be able to see where it's teleporting to, to teleport, but apparently that's not the case. So let's try making the RF tools no teleport module, and we'll use that to prevent Enderman from teleporting. Let's see how well this works. Environment controller with the no teleport module. Make sure it's set to affect hostile mobs. If you have it affect yourself, you just can't use your <laughs> RF tools teleporters. So uh, that's obviously a bad thing. Anyways, I have it set to 60 to 70 Y level and 10 block radius, which should cover, I mean, it comfortably covers this farm. And in fact, you see that enderman trying to teleport away but gets sucked back? Ha ha! All right, I think that fixes the problem. Um, he's not taking damage very fast, but he does eventually die. So I guess eventually dying is good enough. And we are now getting a bunch of grains of infinity here. Cool. So... For the time being, I'm hardening all of our Grains of Infinity. Uh, I guess I'll continue doing that for a little bit, but when we need the actual Liquid Nightmares, we can just, instead of hardening it, we can keep it in the drum. And uh, yeah, that'll be a, a Liquid Nightmare source. So all that's left is the Destructive Will Crystal, but I'll leave that for next time. That's all I've got for today. Tune in tomorrow for a very blood magic heavy episode. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.